And testing, testing, one, two, three. Let's see if we are live. Right, according to YouTube, my connection is good and things are, things are working. Hey everyone, um, welcome back. Thanks, thank you all for being here. Um, yeah, it's it's been a couple of weeks. I was away. Um, I was away for, for one week on holiday and then, as you all know, um, Last Sunday morning, I got woken up with the news that my father was was very very ill, and they expected him to uh, pass away on Sunday. Uh, my father fought really hard, um, but he passed away in the week. So, yeah, everyone, thank you very much for all the very very kind words words of support, and um, yeah, it's good to see you all. I, I really do appreciate all the support that I've been getting, and it's a lot of kindness that was poured out, and uh, I'm grateful for that. I'm really really grateful. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm back and welcome, welcome everyone. Um, hello, Chloe. No, thank you very much. I appreciate the prayers and uh, so many good wishes. I've, it's crazy. Um, I haven't felt, I mean, I really haven't felt alone. I felt really like surrounded by people that care. And it's, it's been a really good, uh, good feeling. Hi, Mariana. So yeah, I don't want to think about that now because I don't want to feel sad. So, um, Nathaniel, welcome. Hi there. Edkin, welcome. Um, Kogito. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, Kogito, you mentioned something about in Islam, um, denial is required. In fact, it is required. I, I know you say that as partly as a joke, but um, there's a concept called, um, so you have slander, right? Ghibba, which is also known as backbiting. Look in the reliance of the traveler for that. And then also you get the thing called namima, right? Which is... Um, tail bearing both are a sin right both are wrong right but within namima what the ruling is is that that someone who tells tales that are true about someone but that causes friction right that causes animosity th those stories must not be believed right so even if it is true but it causes harm especially when it causes harm and not a benefit to muslims you must not believe the person and you must not believe the story it doesn't make a comment on on whether the story is true or not. You just mustn't believe it. Understand? So even if it's true, they have to deny it because it doesn't benefit them. So you have actually touched on a on a on a on a fact. Dodzor, thank you very much. I appreciate it, Stephen. Welcome. Good to see you again. Um, Carl Brown. Good evening. So yeah, I needed to um, yeah I needed to get back in the swing of things. Um, Veronica, thank you, thank you very much. But to all of you. Um, Ghibba, insult, namima, public disorder, Bhutan, actual libel. Yeah, I need to... The thing is, these things go under different names, Eric, and so it depends on what source you look at, whether it's Hindu or whether it's Arabic, you know, Pakistani, whatever. You're going to get Urdu, you know, you're going to get different... Um, not Hindu, Urdu. When you get look at different sources, they have different names, and it's, it can get very confusing. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's not like the same source uses... Uh, different sources use the same names. Okay, guys, so let me, let me go here. So one of the first things I want to do, I want to bring up uh, this islamblog.pl. For those of you who are in Poland um, or know Polish people, um, this is done by one of the supporters on the channel. So yeah, please have a look, islamblog.pl, right? So he's got some information on Islam, which might be useful to people in Poland. And um, he keeps it updated with content. So um, this is for Marek within the channel and yeah if you want to contribute to anything or do anything in terms of Poland um, look I'll be happy to give advice or to provide links or any, anything that I can do here but uh, yeah if you want to contribute to that guys please um, yeah please spread the word you know so at least in Poland there's a resource for this as well Eva that counts for you as well okay XYZ KC welcome okay right guys so where am I gonna start so let me get my notes up okay I did uh, guys, I did send you the notes for today's show, so I'm going to paste these in the chat right now. So these are the notes for today's show. Um, what I'm going to try and do is make the notes available. I just make these little text notes so that you guys can go back and check for yourselves. These are the things that I was referring to. And above here is the link to my personal copy of Reliance of the Traveler. Oh, sorry, the Encyclopedia of Islam. My bad. Okay you're going to need this to make sense of what's happening. And of course, check the description for any other resources that I'm using. All right. Hey, Dragon, welcome. So yeah, please also, so you're going to, this is my personal copy of Encyclopedia of Islam with my own annotation, my notes, 
and it's constantly being updated. As I find things, as I change things, I make updates to it with Adobe Acrobat and it gets stored in the cloud. So you're going to download my copy, which you will see it's got all the information that I put in there, but um, it does change every now and again. So you may need to, you know, if it changes, update, update the file. And of course, um, you're going to need Adobe Acrobat because it doesn't always work properly in other Acrobat readers or in browsers because of the annotations. Okay, so the first thing first, we're going to go to ah, ablution. So I've got a note here about ablution. Now, someone, uh, one of the supporters of the channel sent me some very interesting information, something I was aware of, but not to this depth. So Gnosticism. So Gnosticism has created numerous different cults throughout history. One of those cults is mentioned in Islam. It's called the Sabaeans. Now, the Sabaeans are still around. Oddly enough, they're called the Mandians today. They're called the Mandaeans, Mandians, Mandaeans. They are still around. And one of their crazy ideas is that baptism is something you must do regularly. So they have regular, continuous baptisms, right? Ablution, washing. Now, it may well be that the, that the focus on ablution within Islam is derived from the Mandaeans because they seem to have taken a lot of... I mean, Islam is plagiarized from everywhere, but they do seem to have taken things from the Mandeans, right? They've taken certain concepts and incorporated those into, into Islamic theology and practice. So at some point, I need to dive into the Mandeans specifically and as, an, as, the, as one of the prime Gnostic roots of Islam. And it would seem also that the Hindus, okay, derives a lot of practices from the Mandeans as well. So there's a lot of interesting stuff. So, so look for that in the future. This is going to be very, very interesting. So I do appreciate historical Christianity for passing me that information. Really, really interesting stuff. Okay. So I know we've been going from A down to B and so on through the encyclopedia. However, uh, I do want to have a look at this thing called antinomianism, known as Ibaha. Antinomianism is basically where you ignore you violate basic moral rules you reject morality right so let me see if there's any comments or questions i need to make note of ah remove your site okay there you go you're welcome marek removed ablution minor would major hustle okay now hi mary alex the mandians with in iraq right so that should be very near the yeah, now Excellent point, Nathaniel. Now, if you look at the Mandians, they were also apparently in northern Iraq. Now, I've been in northern Iraq. I've been out that part of the world um, for various reasons in the past. But you also, yeah, southern Iraq, you're also looking. I mean, Kufa and the area around Baghdad comes up constantly. So there's, there's definitely a strong connection to what happened in Kufa and surrounds within Islam. There's definitely a strong connection there that also needs to be teased out more. Okay, so where was I? I was going to be looking at... Okay, so I need to go to the Encyclopedia of Islam. Okay, Antinomianism, page 1. So let me get that up. And this would be here. So, this is the Encyclopedia of Islam. Right, Encyclopedia of Islam. And notice you'll see here, Antinomianism, Ibaha. Okay, so we need to go from here. I'm just going to move this over so I can see this better for myself. Okay. So page 1 and 101, so I need to go to 101. Okay, so Ibaha forms part of Islamic mysticism. Okay, so it falls into mysticism. And notice it's listed here under Sufi practices, the Darwish, the Dervish, right? Dhikr, which is the remembrance of Allah, right? And it's a practice, a ritual where you remember Allah. And of course, Ibaha falls within that. So just make a note, it's also part of Tasawwuf, which is Sufism, which again is Islamic Gnosticism, right? So it falls under mysticism. And let's have another look. And the next reference is 270. So let's go there. And this is important. I just want to bring attention to this. I need to dig deeper into this at another time. So here we go, Ibaha. Okay, it says here, originally making a thing apparent or manifest. So doing something, okay, the permission to do something. So it's, notice they say here, making a thing allowable or free to him who desires it. Now, if you guys have read any of the satanic writings of people like Anton LaVey and, and so on, 
It's very cool. He's the person who said, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Right? So that's one of the satanic creeds. Do what you want. There is no restriction upon you. You are free to do as you please. Your, your will is all that you need to consult to do something. There is no moral law upon you. So making a thing allowable or free to him who desires it. So do what you desire. Do whatever you want. Okay? And it says here, in law, Ibaha was first used with regard to those things which everyone is permitted to use or appropriate. Right? Things you can use or take. And in a narrower sense, Ibaha denotes the authorization given by the owner to consume part of the produce of the property. Okay, different meaning. However, let's look at the theological meaning. So the theological meaning is, Ibaha is a term that is commonly applied to antinomian teachings or actions of Shi and Sufi groups. So Shiite and Sufi groups. As in the accusation, Ibahat al-Mahrim, allowing the forbidden now, when you dig deep into this, what you find is that the Sufis, for whatever reason, they are allowed to practice the forbidden. So they're allowed to circumvent, to violate every Islamic law. As I've mentioned before, it is allowed. So the Sufis are allowed to violate the law so they can break the Islamic law. So any law, any moral teaching, they can violate this. And antinomianism would be to violate the law of God. And they are allowed to thus violate. That's why Islam violates the Mosaic law. Because Muhammad violated the Mosaic law. Muhammad broke the Ten Commandments, right? He, he lied, right? He practiced sexual immorality. He, he, mar he If you look at Leviticus, right? He practiced incest by marrying his son's wife and so on. So this is actually legal given these, well, Given what we see here, this tells us that we need to dig deeper into this and we will start to find that there's actually a lot more to Islamic law than we're aware of, especially within the occult aspect of Islam. So, yes, the Sufis are immune to such, definitely. Dude, you need to change that Arabic name. I, good grief, man. So, hi, Built for Speed 101, welcome. Oh, by the way, um, thank you all of you again for the support you gave. Uh, you guys have seen that... Um, Apostate Prophet actually posted in his community tab that he wants to um, talk about Sharia law. And he wants to go through these legal manuals live on air, which is fantastic. Finally, finally, someone's with the name is talking about it. But many of you have suggested that, that he speaks to me, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much for the recommendation. Thank you for the support. Um, yeah, I think this is something that Muslims are frightened of. They do not want this revealed. This is something they're very, very frightened of. Mary Alex, yes, it is sickening, but understand they can they can break any of God's laws. They're allowed to. So yeah, let's hope let's hope Sharia becomes common because this leaves them nowhere to hide. Right? The Sharia makes things very, very plain. Okay, so now let's go to page 184. So Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume 1. Hmm. Oh, don't tell me I made a mistake. There we go. Okay, so let me just type in the words. It's going to be much easier for me to find it. Okay, so this is where we ended last time. I'm going to pick up from this point by Yina. Okay, clear, evident. In the Quran, Bayina appears as a substantive meaning manifest proof. Now, interestingly, Bruce Six, thank you very much. And um, the moment AP watches Brother Lloyd's teachings of Sharia law and fix Abdul's go, whoosh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mary Alex, yes, um, you've never heard of such things before. Well, Muslims don't want you to know these things about their deen. Don't forget, Islam is not a religion. It's a deen. It's a political system which, which requires subjugation under the use of force, right? That's in the definition of deen. It's a totalitarian political system which subjugates others by force, right? So these are basic definitions, things that, that they hide, things they don't want you to know. Okay, so now I want you to note here, manifest proof. Now in law, Bayina denotes the proof per excellentium, so that the most amazing proof, the best proof, right? The most positive, the, the highest proof that is established by oral testimony, 
right? Now, make a note of that. The Bible, even though it has, we've got the Dead Sea Scrolls, you've got all of the scholars from the first centuries, right? From the, from the, from the first century, the second century, writing about the Bible, and that the Bible can be reconstructed from the writings of, of the people living in that era who wrote about it, quoted from it, right? Commented on it. This is not accepted as valid within Islam. Those writings are not accepted as valid. As far as they're concerned, it is not mutawatir. Islam, for which there are no early sources, as much as they want to tell you that there are no early sources, right? They believe that the oral testimony of their, of their chains of transmission, they believe that these are mutawatir. Because Islamic evidence puts more weight on oral testimony than it does on written documentation. Written documentation would be valid for, let's say, a sale, right? That's where they, well, that's where they say, look, written documentation is valid. But for things like their beliefs, oral testimony by witnesses is said to be more important. And then, of course, they look at the character of the witnesses. Now, this, of course, is, is just the game of telephone. There is no way to actually prove a lot of this. And they could have just faked it, which they have. Now, it says here, <clears throat> applied not only to the fact of giving testimony at law, but also to the witnesses themselves. Therefore, they have to claim these witnesses had good character and would have no reason to lie. How do you know? They don't, right? So, let's have a look at Bayina in the... I'm going to go to Volume 1 of, of the Encyclopedia of Islam, pages 1210 and 1211. Okay, so let's have a look here by Ina. Welcome, Dixit. Hello there. Welcome, welcome. And uh, Islam is a surrender pact and mafia. Well, the word mafia, um, Erkin says, Islam is a surrender pact and mafia combined into one. The word mafia, okay, mafi, apparently does come from an Islamic source. It stems from the time when Islam conquered those islands off the coast of Italy. So those are actually, uh, I hope, that, let's see, I have a message that just came in. Oh, uh, man. No. Okay, I'm going to have to check that later. Give me a moment. So, okay. Baina, plural Baina. Clear, evident, manifest proof in numerous passengers, passages of the Quran. Okay. So it's substantial the meaning of manifest proof. Now it says here, proof per excellentium, that established by oral testimony, not proof established by written testimony, not proof established by manuscript, but by someone making so with his mouth and saying, Johnny said, that Sally said, that Mark said, that James said, that Mo said, that, you know, Gabriel said, that, yeah, and, and that's just telephone. So the term came to be applied not only to the fact of giving testimony at law, but also to the witnesses themselves. Uh, okay, I've just made a wrong mistake with my... Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. Fix it. So, now notice argument, proof in general or at law. Now it mentions here a document constituting proof. Okay, but that would seemingly be a secondary source of evidence, not a primary source of evidence. Okay, they have Dalil, conclusive indication, and Burhan, demonstration. Um, I actually had a Muslim again, yesterday or today, tell me, show us your proof. Okay, give us your proof. What that means is they're referring to Burhan. They want a demonstration of decisive proof, verbally. Right, and they've, don't forget, they've already rejected your evidence. But notice, it is fundamentally to oral testimony that the Quran prescribes recourse oral testimony bears supremacy over written testimony. Therefore, the biblical scripts, the biblical texts don't matter to them because they care about the words that they were supposedly given from witnesses through these isnads, these chains of transmission, which is insanity. Now notice they speak of eyewitnesses who ought to corroborate and they can say that these witnesses are trustworthy. Therefore, what they've said is true. Now, classical Islamic law consecrated the superiority of proof by testimony. Notice the superiority of proof by testimony, requiring for its validity the fulfillment of some fairly stringent theoretical conditions. Theoretical conditions. 
So, uh, hopefully that, that makes something... Sicily, yes, Mary Alex. So, hopefully that makes clear. So, we need to... So, again, this provides evidence for the fact that we need to look deeper into how Islam is structured, how it thinks, how the scholars created it in the 9th and 10th and 11th and 12th centuries. We really need to look into how Islam was constructed. So, yeah, and this is, this is part of how it thinks. So, it ignores the written evidence and it, it's very, very interested in word of mouth. Right? And the word of mouth can be anything you want it to be. So yeah, Kogito Ogis says, Muhammad said that, Jibril said that, Allah said, and that's the foundation of Islam. Exactly. And that's the entire foundation of Islam. So let me continue here. Okay, so now I've got to go to Reliance, page 33 to 44. Okay, so this is Reliance. Now, something I want to educate you guys about as well. This is book B in the Reliance, The Validity of Following Qualified Scholarship. Okay, so let's have a look at what's on page 33. Scholarly consensus, the Ijma is defined in section D7. And then notice it says here, scholarly consensus is legally binding. The scholarly consensus is legally binding. Walter says the first thing they did was throw Torah under the bus. Of course they did. They broke Muhammad. I mean, who knows if the guy was even real, right? But whatever, whatever, he broke every law of Moses to show that to show that he was superior to Moses he was superior to Jesus in fact the fact that he can break every every law means that he must be superior to Allah because those laws are not binding upon him because if you look at okay the Christian and Jewish concept of God okay he is logos okay God is in Christianity God is logos in Islam Allah is will. Logos versus will. Remember the satanic creed? Do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Whereas within Christianity, we, our morality stems from what we think, who is the absolute moral arbiter within, within our lives? That is, that is God, right? So he holds the absolute moral standard of good. So you will judge your actions on that basis. Whereas in these in these other views, like within Islam, these antinomian views, there is no God to stop you. You can do what you like. You are the God, right? So now, within Islam, with Allah being will and not Logos, Logos is by, by default necessarily constrained. Logos cannot lie, cannot deceive. It is truth, right? Therefore, God cannot lie. God has to be truthful. Whereas Allah is totally, supposedly powerful, Nothing restrains him, so therefore he has no boundaries. Therefore he can lie. Therefore he can deceive. Because to say that Allah cannot do something is a sin in Islam. It's to constrain Allah. It's to make him smaller. It's to make him less. So therefore Allah is capable of doing anything evil. So Allah is capable of being evil. This is a very different theological concept to that of the, the Jewish Christian view of God. Totally different. Understand? So... If you, if you extend that Muhammad is the is on the same plane as Allah, essentially, then he can do anything, including break all the laws. And if Muhammad's the perfect Muslim, his example extends to effectively all Muslims. Although Muhammad sits on a higher plane, so therefore only the highest scholars can then duplicate Muhammad's antinomian methods and beliefs. So the Sufis are able to do that. Okay, so hopefully that gives you some clarity into understanding Mantuk is completely different from Logos. Um, Irkan says, Mantuk is also a form of um, abrogation. Okay, you have the Mantuk and the Mafhum, right? So when one word replaces another, but in the Quran, the sentence says the sky is blue. But the scholars, over time, for whatever reason, they determined that the new context of this is that the sky is bright pink. Right, So when they read it, they understand that the sky is bright pink. The sentence itself does not change. The sentence will always say the sky is blue because that's what's written. But the way it's understood is completely opposite, totally different from what is written. That's the mantuk and the mafhum, at least as I know it. Okay, So that's a form of abrogation, but it's a very, very rarely known form of abrogation. So, okay, scholarly consensus is legally binding. So the ijma, the consensus of the scholars, is legally binding. Now, it says here, one may not follow other than the four schools. Those are the four schools of jurisprudence, the four main schools. Okay, Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, and Shafi. Now, it says here, 
Um, what is the proof that it is legally valid and even obligatory to accept the authority of qualified scholarship called taqlid? Taqlid is when you, as a Muslim, decide to follow a scholar and he guides you. Okay, When one is not capable of issuing expert legal opinion, ijtihad on matters of sacred law, because the average Muslim, even though they have mouths that do this a lot, they are not capable of issuing expert legal opinion. That's why whenever I ask them to do so, they cannot do so. One, well, one of the reasons is, A, they don't know, and B, Sharia is a secret. They cannot reveal it to you. It would be exposing one of the weaknesses of Islam. It would be exposing the foundations, something which would leave them exposed, and therefore it is illegal. Two, they're not allowed to share. Three, they're not allowed to share Islamic knowledge with you if you're going to use it for what they would call an unjust or unlawful purpose, which is what I am doing, right? So notice it says here, so I've got to go to page 44 on this. So qualify to issue expert legal opinion. A mujtahid, only a mujtahid. So the scholars, this is why Muslims will always tell you, have you asked a scholar? Well, hey, I'm a scholar. For sure I'm a scholar at this point. So yeah. Now, I'm not saying that I can issue expert legal opinion, but I can tell you what the scholars have said. Well, because I read their stuff. So now, this ability being ijtihad. Now, ijtihad is to be able to make a ruling, to make a determination, to apply judgment to a situation. But that judgment must be within the bounds, the constraints of the sharia right so free thinking free thought is not allowed within islam it must be constrained by the sharia and the sharia overrules your judgment it overrules your morality it overrules your thinking right so they mention here book 022.1 d the qualifications of islamic judge we'll get to that so let me take a look in the notes and see on the chat and see if i've missed anything okay so Paul Anker says he threw the Sabbath on the trash heap. Just one example. All previous laws abrogated. Yes, everything. Stephen Gilker says, so Allah can do anything. Why can't he have a son without a consort? You know, <laughs> Allah can do anything, but Allah can't come to earth either. You know, totally powerful. Can't come to earth. So, um, Veronica, I hope I've explained what Mantuk is. Maybe Erkin can also mention his version of Mantuk. And... Um, Kogito, lie is to get something you want by deceit because you're powerless to get it otherwise. Yes. Um, Marek P, finding in front of, the, front of the computer. Yes, okay. Mariana, Islam equals submission. Okay, so guys, let me continue with this. Uh, also, I'm going to, just for the moment, I'm going to paste my notes again. So these are the notes. I'm going to drop this in the chat. This, these, You can refer to this afterwards so you can actually see what it was I read. Okay, all the links are in the description, and here's the link to Encyclopedia of Islam. So you can go through this afterwards because you've got the show notes now. Okay, so now the difference between the qualifications for the Imam of a school and those for a judge, a Qadi, Yasser Qadi is a judge. Okay, so you have an Imam for a school, you have different levels of Imams, and those for a judge or a Mufti. A Mufti is someone who is capable of issuing fatwa, a judge sits in a court. A mufti issues fatwa, like Islam QA issues fatwa. But these fatwas are non-binding because binding fatwas are in the Sharia. The binding fatwas were issued by the four imams of the four schools of jurisprudence. On a, or a mufti is that the former's competence in giving opinion is absolute. So the difference between the qualifications of an imam of a school and those for a judge or a mufti is that the former's competence in giving opinion is absolute. Interesting. Okay, extending to all subject matters in the sacred law, while the competence of the judge or a mufti is limited respectively to judging court cases or to applying his imam's ijtihad to particular questions. Okay, so hopefully that helps. So the imam of a school, right, you're looking at someone like Shafi, I would assume, right, the head of a particular school, they are absolute, now, the, now an absolute the opinion is absolute, meaning they are the perfect scholars. This is called a mujtahid mutlaq, M-U-T-L-A-K or M-U-T-L-A-Q. A mujtahid mutlaq is the absolute scholar. Hanafi, Hanbali, Shafi, Maliki, the four schools, the founders of the four schools are absolute scholars. So, yeah, looks like I'm annoying people on YouTube. So, understand, they cannot be wrong. It's impossible for them to make a mistake. 
Built for Speed says, what's baffling is how Muslims don't question that Islam and the Quran is built on a single witness. Uh, yeah, well, they claim it that, that so from Mo to Khadija to whomever, it's like whatever, but yeah. Right. But yeah, Islam is a house built on sand. I mean, there's no witnesses, but okay, let's continue. Now, it says no age of history is totally lacking people who are competent in the Ijtihad and particular questions which are new. And this is an important aspect of sacred law, to provide solutions to new ethical problems by means of sound Islamic legal methodology in applying the Quranic and Hadith primary texts. Like, for instance, the question has arisen within Islam, is it legal to eat mermaids? If you catch a mermaid, can you eat one? Now, I know this is a problem that we in the West have struggled with for centuries. Can we eat mermaids? Like, for instance, if you meet Ariel from the Little Mermaid at the shore, can you catch her, barbecue her, and eat her with sauce? Well, um, Islam has taken the time to answer this question. If you guys have watched some of my previous shows, you know I've, we've, we've, we've read through the fatwa on that one. And the answer is yes, you can. But, <clears throat> okay, so... Okay, so now the doors of Ishtihad is not and cannot be closed in this example, in this specific sense, because the fiqh has to be applied to new situations as society develops, right? But Islamic scholarship has not accepted anyone's claims to absolute Ijtihad since Imams Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, and Ahmad of the four schools. They are the only absolute scholars who can make no mistakes and do no wrong. Okay, it says if one studies the intellectual legacy of these men and the scholars have a working familiarity with it, it is not difficult to see why. Now, to urge that a tide is not divinely protected from error is as of little relevance to his work as the fact that the major physicist is not divinely protected from simple errors in calculus. The probability of finding them in his published work is virtually negligible, which is nice, except that the Islamic scholars do claim that these scholars are divinely protected from error because they'll refer to the statement that the hand of Allah is over the group and he will not make his followers concur upon misguidance. I've covered this in the past. So therefore, they cannot be wrong. They cannot make a mistake. They cannot be in error. Regarding other long dead schools such as the Zahiriya, the difference between their work and that of the four living schools is firstly one of quality as their positions and evidence have not been re-examined and upgraded by succeeding generations of first-ranked scholars like those of the four schools. Secondly, there is the lack of verification of the actual positions of the Mujtahids through reliable chains of transmitters. Reliable chains of transmitters. Again, not written documentation, reliable people who said nice things. So that's called propaganda. Now notice the Quranic evidence for following scholars. Yes, you must follow a scholar because Islam says, Ask those who recall if you know not. Okay, ask those who know. And all the scholars of, of the fundamentals of Islamic law have made this verse their principal evidence. It is obligatory for the ordinary person to follow the scholar who is a mujtahid. So this is what makes Sharia supreme over even the Quran. That supersedes the Quran. Because this, by consensus of the scholars, this verse is an imperative for someone who does not know a ruling in sacred law or the evidence of it to follow someone who does, and that's the four scholars of the four schools and their successors. Allah prohibited the people to go out altogether. Okay, now skip all that. Let's just move around. Okay, now notice <clears throat> there were various levels of knowledge in religion, but not all of them were capable of giving formal legal opinion. So that rested with those major scholars. And let me see if I need to cover anything in particular here. Um, Now, it says here that ordinary people in times of the companions and those who immediately follow them used to seek the opinion of the mujtahids and would follow them in rules of sacred law. After Muhammad came the companions and the followers of the companions and the learned among them would unhesitatingly answer their questions without alluding, alluding to mention of evidence. So according to the tradition, there was no evidence given. So therefore, they didn't take evidence into account. You're just supposed to believe because the scholars are right and never to be questioned. This is why, because, and this obviously is also Quranically based, you're just supposed to not ask questions, otherwise you'd enter into doubt. Doubt is not legal. 
let's move on. And okay, disagreement. So notice here, there's just something that's of interest here. Now, Muslims will say, but the scholars disagreed. Okay. The ordinary people and learners not at the main figure's level of understanding were unconcerned with disagreement because there were sometimes discussions and dispute between leading representatives. However, it says that ordinary people, this is not for them to be concerned about. Yasser Qadi said that as well. This is not for them to be concerned about. So assuming that a person does not have qualifications, okay, you will, okay, skip all that. So you must follow a competent authority and... Okay, the surahs of the claim here, the surahs of the Quran, all its verses and these hadiths which have reached us by so many channels of transmission, belief in them is obligatory and they are all unquestionably established transmission, telephone game. It is impossible that the various channels could have conspired to fabricate them. Of course, they could well have conspired to, to fabricate them. They're not allowed to say anything that is con contrary to Islam. Okay, so I'm going to jump off this topic and I'm going to go to page 43. So notice here, Allah's hand is over the group and whoever descends from them departs to hell. So Muslims must follow the Sharia, right? And whoever disagrees, now the Sharia is presented by the major scholars because they're the ones who know. And if a Muslim doesn't follow that, he is bound for hell. So whoever diverges from the overwhelming majority concerning what is lawful or unlawful, on which the community does not differ, has slipped off the path of guidance, and this will lead him to hell. So in other words, Muslims say, but the scholars disagree. Yes, they do, on irrelevant small amounts of things according to the Sharia, but they agree on things that are 75% of things they agree on completely. There is no disagreement, and these are the substantial issues within the religion. Okay, And notice it says here, other than the four school, Sunni schools of jurisprudence, they do not necessarily play a role in scholarly consensus. The other schools are irrelevant other than the four Sunni schools. And there is scholarly consensus on its being, not, on its being unlawful to follow rulings from schools other than those of the four Imams. Okay, so yeah, hopefully that clarifies what's happening with the four schools, why they're important. And I want to go then, so now I'll go to section 0643. Let's have a look at what do you need to do to be a Qadi, to be an Islamic judge? What are the things that are needed? Okay, so Mein Kampf is much, uh, Erkin says, Mein Kampf is much more honest than the Quran. It's annoying to read, but not disorganized. Quran causes headaches. Yeah, it, it's, it's just a mess. Okay, so hopefully this clarifies what Sharia is in terms of that Muslims are bound by it. The scholars are superior to them and they, there's no escape for them. They can't make up their own rulings. They can't make up their own, they, they have to follow what they're told, right? Um, let me see, so the qualifications. A Qadi must have full capacity for moral answerability, okay? And he must possess knowledge of the rulings of sacred law, meaning by way of personal legal reasoning. So he must be able to make judgments from the primary text, that's the Quran and the Sunnah, not merely by following a particular qualified scholar, now, what's interesting, this is called taklid. This is what is what basic lay Muslims are supposed to do. They must follow a particular qualified scholar because they are not allowed to make judgments. They can lie to you a whole day, but they're not allowed to make their own judgments about legal issues. Being qualified to perform legal reasoning requires knowledge of the rules and principles of the Quran, the Sunnah. In this context, meaning the Hadith, because the Sunnah would normally mean the Sirah, the biographies of Muhammad as well as knowledge of scholarly consensus. Interesting, they have to know the consensus. Okay. The Qadi must also know Nasik, which supersede previously revealed Quranic verses, and Mansuk, which are superseded by later verses. So the Sharia itself, the Fiqh of Islam, the sacred law, shows us that abrogation is real. And Muslims will lie whole day about abrogation. And they speak of the types of Sunnah, okay, Mutawat al Hadith which are obligatory to believe in and denial of which is unbelief, kufr. So mutawat and hadith are obligatory to believe in and if a Muslim doesn't, he is committing kufr, right? 
So again, oral is paramount. Kogito Oga says, oral, how do they know? They read the read in a book. Exactly. Oral beliefs are paramount over actual written. That's why they, that's why they can just discard the Bible. So Paul Anka, Islamic scholars tend to destroy the discussion documents so they fail to reach a single consensus. Yeah, they've had to make the consensus because they couldn't reach a consensus, but yeah, they needed to they needed to have a single set of ideas across they at least were close enough across the empire. Okay. Mariana makes a very good point. They don't read, they recite, and most do not even understand what they are reciting. So Paul Anka, why four schools necessary? Why no clear teaching? Okay. Um, look, you're never going to mistake Muslims for being pff, Baptists. You're never going to mistake them for being Buddhists. Muslims look like Muslims, right? The four schools are because they speak of, okay, the, the differences between the four schools are known as ihtilaf, right? This is basically the difference. But there's a scholar that is regarded as the, the main scholar on the issue of the differences between the four schools, a man called Shar'ani. He wrote a book called the Mizan al-Kubra, the supreme balance, the, the supreme scales, the great balance, right? So the way they view it is that the companions of Muhammad, right, all interpreted Muhammad's words and actions slightly differently. So each one of them practiced slightly differently. So therefore it's inferred by the scholars that these slightly divergent practices by all of the different followers of Muhammad from the early days, his companions, must mean that there's room for variety. Because the, so the scholars have inferred that people have different levels of understanding, their intellectual ability to grasp. But Allah has allowed a mercy of differences or variation because not everyone understands as well. Not everyone's equally smart. Okay. And also not everyone is equally committed. Not everyone is equally free to do things. Not everyone is equally capable. So what they're saying is that those who can should and those who can't, who are weaker, they're allowed, they're permitted to do things differently. Now, for instance, if you're busy praying, if you hold your hands here versus hold your hands here versus hold your hands down here, those are differences, but those are not things that change the beliefs, right? They, they're not, those are just, those would be just, what's the word for this? Some aesthetic differences. They're not fundamental differences that alter the doctrines, right? So those are, so 25% of the differences in Islam can be ignored. On 75% of issues, they agree. The 25% where they don't are irrelevancies, right? So, so hopefully that gives you some insight into the differences between the different groups. Uh, let me sh make sure I'm not getting off track here. Okay, so 643 to 647. <clears throat> okay, so interesting. Now you've got designations within the Hadith. The designations do not directly influence the authenticity rating of Hadith. Interesting. A singular Hadith, for example, might be rigorously authenticated, Sahih, well-authenticated Hadiths of both types being obligatory for a Muslim to believe in. Interesting. Though someone who denies them is merely considered corrupt and not an unbeliever. So if a Hadith is not mutawatir, you're corrupt. Okay, You're not considered an unbeliever, but it is still obligatory to believe in them so yeah muslims will love to lie to us whole day about those things okay now they mention here the positions held by the most learned of the companions on legal questions and those and those are the scholars who came after them and on which of these positions there is scholarly consensus so a qadi an islamic judge must know the positions held by the most learned of the companions right which sometimes differed on legal questions and those are the scholars who came after them and also on which of these positions there is scholarly consensus. In other words, where there is agreement. And the last page. Okay, notice. He must also be familiar, he must also be totally familiar with the rules of the Sunnah. Right? What are the rules of the Sunnah? Where do you find the rules of the Sunnah? Remember, if Islam is a religion of law, what are its laws and where do we find them? Now notice though, he says here, okay. An absolute expert in Islamic legal reasoning, a mujtahid mutlaq, such as Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, or Ahmad, is obliged to know what relates to every matter in sacred law. So these four scholars who founded the four schools are absolute scholars. They are the perfect scholars. They cannot be wrong. Okay? 
So when two primary texts seem to contain, he has to know how to determine the difference between them. Okay, so any questions? So oral tradition would have prevented the mess that comes from Erasmus without consonants, partly written in Arabic and interpreted. Okay, true. That's a good point. Stephen says the Quran is another. Okay. The Quran is the most comfortable toilet paper out. <laughs> well, okay. <clears throat> okay. So let me skip to the next thing. Let me move on. Um, so we go back to... Oh, apparently I have something on page 60 I want to look at. Oh, just, just so you know, <laughs> uh, the child becomes an adult after his first wet dream. Just so you know. Um, yeah, the pen has been lifted from three, the sleeper until he awakens, because you are not responsible for any bad things while you're sleeping, because you're sleeping. You couldn't have done anything wrong. The child until his first wet dream and the insane person until he can reason. So insane people are not morally responsible. They cannot be responsible for their actions because they're cuckoo. But the child, once he has his first wet dream, he is now grown up, he's a boy, and he's legally responsible. So that's how you know you're a big boy now. And yeah, so Allah chose that as the criteria. Okay, um, let's move forward again. Okay, so now I've got to go back here to this one. Okay, and I want to go to page 931. Oh, wrong book. I want to look at something to do with Bidda, reprehensible innovation. Okay. Now, Bidda in Islam, one of the words we came to is innovation. Innovation is misguidance, right? Because everything in Islam has already been decided. Anything that's new, any new ijtihad, any new reasoning has to comply with the sharia completely. So now, any innovation is misguidance. So things invented is, okay? So distance yourselves and be wary of matters, wary of matters newly innovated that did not previously exist. This is why Islam has one foot fully, permanently stuck in the past. Because you cannot adopt new things that are newly invented that did not previously exist so new rulings new thoughts new ideas things invented in islam that contravene the sacred law notice they don't say that contravene the quran that contravene the hadith they say things that contravene the sacred law the sacred law is decided the sacred law is the the final interpretation of the quran and hadith meaning that for every innovation is misguidance meaning that every innovation is the opposite of truth it is a falsehood, right? Every innovation is the opposite of truth. Are the innovations that are not allowed within Islam? Well, certainly. So therefore, it is false. That's why Christianity in Islam is false. It is an innovation that contravenes Islamic sacred law. Therefore, it is the opposite of truth. Therefore, Islam is the deen ul haq, the religion of truth. Islam is the perfectly true religion. Christianity is the deen al batl the false religion, the religion of Satan, because battle is one of the names of Satan. Okay, just thought I should mention that. Okay, they mention here again, okay, with things with the basis in sacred law. What is the sacred law? You know, why not the Quran, the basis in sacred law? The first category comprises innovations that are obligatory, such as, and what would that be? Recording the Quran and the laws in Islam, laws of Islam in writing. So, innovations that are found to be obligatory. What does Islam must have to do? They had to record the Quran, and they had to record the laws of Islam in writing. So we know what the Quran is, we can get a copy of the thing and read it. And the laws of Islam also had to be put in writing, separately. Right? So where are they found? Well, we're busy reading a law book right now. There are numerous of them. Not all of them are relevant. There's a hierarchy. Understand, within each school, there's a hierarchy. And then across the top ones, there's a hierarchy as well. Right. So, when it was feared that something might be lost from them, okay, so they had to make sure that they recorded the Islamic law. So, we know that the Islamic law was written down. The second category is that of unlawful innovation, such as non-Islamic taxes and levies. 
giving positions of authority in sacred law to those unfit for them. So giving positions of authority in sacred law to those unfit for them. So only people who are trained in sacred law can make these sacred law judgments. And yeah, the lay Muslim is unfit for this. The third category consists of innovations which are recommended, such as building hostels and schools of sacred law. A school of sacred law. You need to build schools of sacred law. They didn't say schools of the Quran. Schools of sacred law. So sacred law seems to be very, very important within Islam. They also need to record the research of Islamic schools of legal thought, writing books on beneficial subjects, extensive research into fundamentals, and particular applications of sacred law. So the Sharia would seem to be very, very important. That they need to study this, they need to apply it, they need to extend it, they need to preserve it. So make a note, this is very, very important. And of course, they mention here the Wirds, okay? By those with the Sufi path or circles of dhikr in which the movement of the participants increases their remembrance of Allah. Yeah, increases their remembrance of Allah. Let's have a look at one of these um, Sufi dances that increases the remembrance of Allah. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely going to help you to uh, know Allah better. I guess I get from this that Allah likes people to run around in a circle with their... Uh, yeah, squeezed up tight together. Okay, so, so now you've learned something about this. Okay, I want to mention a couple of things. Um, because I'm going to come up to this a little bit later, but I'll mention it now. Notice they say here, the Islamic resistance movement. This is Article 2 of the Hamas Charter. Okay, this is the Charter of Hamas. It says, and the, the proper name of Hamas, of Hamas is the Islamic resistance movement. Right? And it is one of the wings of the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine. The Muslim Brotherhood is a universal organization which constitutes the largest Islamic movement in modern times. So it's the largest Islamic organized Islamic group in the world. It is characterized by its deep understanding, accurate comprehension, and its complete embrace of all Islamic concepts, including the spreading of Islam and the science of the occult. Now, why would Hamas be talking about the science of the occult? Well, because it's part of the Muslim Brotherhood, because the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood was two things. One, a Sufi. Two, he was a Freemason. Have a look at Hassan al-Banna. Al-Banna, the builder, Arabization of Mason, Freemason, Hassan the builder, Hassan the Freemason. Okay, so make a note of that because there's, there's a lot of fancy, funny things about Islam with its occult mysticism. So let's go back to where I started. Okay, make sure that I think I've covered everything that I wanted to there. And Burhan, page 189. <clears throat> okay, so we'll continue. Okay, so this concept called Burhan, right? Muslims will say they want proof. They want to debate. And as we, as we showed in one of the previous shows, their form of debate is a deceptive rhetoric. It's a deceitful rhetoric. It's a method. Burhan is decisive proof, clear demonstration, a Quranic term signifying a brilliant manifestation, a shining light from Allah. In correlation, Burhan is also the decisive proof which infidels are called upon to furnish as justification of their false beliefs. Now understand, you cannot provide justification of your beliefs because they've already deemed them false. There is no justification. They've already determined your beliefs are false because they believe that their decisive proof is a shining manifestation, a light from Allah. That light from Allah, well, that happens to be Mo. Okay, he's the light from Allah. Now in law, Burhan re refers to the quality of certitude based upon an argument of authority which can either be a scriptural text or more importantly to them not the text the blah 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 or the eyewitnessing of an obvious fact which is proper to reasoning in order to prove the radical distinction between the identity of two comparable things now notice though the eyewitnessing of an obvious fact now when we say eyewitness we mean we saw something we physically were there and we saw it now, earlier when we showed you the mutawatir, which is obligatory to believe in, what Muslims are taught is that 
When it is obligatory to believe in, they must believe it as if they were an eyewitness to the event, an eyewitness to the fact. Understand? So this, so they are inventing these standards, but so basically you believe it because you were an eyewitness to the fact, even though it happened 1400 years ago and you were born yesterday and you weren't there to see it, but you believe it as if. Understand? These are very different ways that we view what is an eyewitness. Okay? And what is authority? So, any questions or comments before I go on? Let me see what I've missed in the meantime. Sufi dance, similar to the priests of Baal. I have no idea. Can you believe the University of Oxford hands out PhD for this utter garbage? Are they? Oh, good grief! Tell me about that. Um. Yeah. So let me see if I've missed anything. Harkat al Okay, Hamas. Okay, thanks. Science, occult, yeah, well, Islam has a lot of sciences. They've got science of rhetoric. They've got most, the most important sciences in Islam are the religious sciences, okay? Religious sciences. The science of the practical is called this ilam al -amal, right? Everything else is sciences of the religious sciences. The religious sciences were brought by Muhammad. Understand? The religious sciences were brought by Muhammad. Muhammad is the first and greatest scientist all other sciences are secondary or tertiary or just just very very low importance relative to the sciences muhammad brought what science was this well it's actually the science of the occult the secret knowledge the gnos the gnos the gnosticism the gnos the gnosis the gnosis or gnosis whatever okay so uh stephen okay so let me see if there's any comments that i missed i was on dawa channel yesterday and they were laughing at the implementation of sharia in the past Oh, were they? Very, very interesting. Islam is mental illness. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Okay, so let me continue now. So, 189. Okay, so I'll just continue with my notes here. Okay, Dai. Notice, a Dai sometimes spelled D-A-double-E, right? A Dai is someone who is a Dawagandist. Now, I know the term Dawagandist has become popular in, within, the, um, within the circles of polemics and um, apologetics, within Christian apologetic circles. However, notice what they say here. A Dai, he who summons to the true faith, a title used for their chief propagandists. For some reason, the Encyclopedia of Islam, the gold standard of Islamic knowledge, right, the gold standard academic reference to Islam worldwide, calls Da'is propagandists, not missionaries. It calls them literally propagandists, which is insane. Okay, a Da'i, so in other words, you take you take someone like um, the not a medical doctor, Zakir Naik, He's a propagandist. He's a dai. He's a propagandist. You take um, you take his mentor, okay? Um, who's the guy? Come on in. What was the name of his mentor? Um, Didat. Didat is a propagandist. According to this, so a dai, if we look it up in Islam, this is supposed to be someone who is a missionary, right? Whereas here it actually says propagandist. So, um, Kogito Oga says, Islam, eyewitness. In Christianity, that would definition would be delusion. Yeah, well, you're participating in a delusion. That is true. Uh, let me see if I've missed anything. Paul Anker says, why did oral transmission of the Quran have to change to written transmission? Oral transmission was supposed to have worked perfectly to begin with. If someone can memorize the Quran or can or not. Well, don't forget. So don't forget ikhtilaf. Not all humans are the same. Some have less ability than others. So... And also, the problem is the loss of those people. If those people die, if they're killed in war. That's why there, were, there was this piece that I skipped over within the Sharia, which is based upon Quran and Hadith, that of the people who knew the Quran, some were being killed, right? Which means that people had, different people had memorized different sections, and there were too few to properly remember. So they had to protect those who knew the Quran. So they had to, and because they, they couldn't guarantee that they could keep all these people safe, they had to write it down. Okay. So Paul Anker says propagandist assumes deceit and brainwashing. Exactly. It's a, it's a government corporate message, right? Da'if. Notice here, da'if means weak. Synonym, wadi. Notice, unable to bear arms. 
unable to bear arms. It's also a military term. You're too weak to go to war. You're too weak to fight for Islam. In the science of tradition, this would be the Hadith and possibly the Sunnah, or possibly the Shrit the Sirah, the term for a weak tradition, infirm, something that is infirm, to traditions without any claim to reliability. But we also know that this is not true. Okay, As I've shown before, Da'if Hadith are reliable Hadith. They are true. Even the Sharia relies on Da'if Hadith to prove its case. Right. So notice that Again, here's a bit of a deception. You'd have to dig deeper. We'd have to go to volume eight, page 983 to look further into this. But that's something I'll leave for you guys to, to have a look at. Okay, so Dragon says, then Surah 1933, Jesus said, blessed be the day I was born, die and rise again. Yeah, exactly. Islam contradicts itself because according to Islamic eschatology, I mean, Jesus was saved from the um, crucifixion, right? He was taken into heaven, doesn't die, comes back, Fights at the side of Mo, destroys the cross, destroys Christianity, right? Fights the Jews and whatnot. And then he marries, lives for a while, then dies. So how does the Quran say, blessed is the day that I was, you know, that I was born, die, and rise again? Because according to the eschatology, he just dies at the end, doesn't come back. Because he comes back, so he doesn't die, comes back, and then dies. So yeah, Islam makes no sense. Okay, so I'm just going to paste the links again so that you guys have a copy of the encyclopedia, my copy that I'm using here, so you can see it as, as I have it. And then also the notes, the show notes that I'm working off of, which are right here. Okay, so in Moroccan, Nathaniel says, in Moroccan Arabic, the verb form of da'i can mean to curse, to swear. Very interesting, because in Hebrew, Allah means to curse, or a curse. Allah is a curse. Kogito ergo, so okay, let's see. Muhammad never bothered to put the Quran into a code because knew it was trash. Can you imagine Moses not writing, having written anything down? Um, you know, on that point, with uh, with regard to Moses, I've been doing some research into the... This is going to annoy people because, man, I'm at, at the risk of upsetting people in the future, I need to talk about the hatred of the Catholic Church within the Protestant churches. Because many Protestant churches and many Protestants absolutely hate the Catholic Church. Now, I'm not a Catholic. I was raised a Protestant my whole life. Okay? I was raised within the Church of England. And um, even I have problems with the Protestant churches. And and now, obviously, I also have problems with the Catholic Church. I think a lot of Catholics have a problem with the Catholic Church. They realize the Church has gone astray. But then um, you can point to issues within the Catholic Church. And yes, you can point to issues within the Protestant Church. And I guarantee you, if you start digging into the Protestant churches, you're not going to like what you find, as much as you may not like what you find within the Catholic Church. But I do want to try to factually put this story together and say, look, Protestants, Catholics. And Protestants have gone out of their way. Many, many Protestants have gone out of their way to lie about the Catholic Church. Now, it's one thing to point out, it's, no, it's one thing to point out problems, legitimate, true genuine issues within a church but when you have to start lying that's an, that's a problem okay that's a serious problem like i said i'm not a catholic although i do live in a catholic country and i can't say that i i go to a catholic church and i have no idea what they're saying i don't speak polish so but but this the stories that people tell about the catholic church that i've yet to see a lot of that stuff i haven't seen it okay but that said i need to Start putting this into perspective and start, because man, you start looking at someone like Martin Luther, there are some serious problems, there are some serious problems. Calvinists, some serious issues with their theology, their misinterpretation of the Bible, okay? Um, there, there are some serious issues within Protestantism, and um, definitely, so yeah, I'll be putting, that's, that's my opinion, those are my thoughts, but I'm going to be trying to put this into a genuine perspective to present the arguments, okay? So... Allah Akbar in Hebrew means cursed mouse. That, Mariana, that would well be true. Okay. So let me see. Um, okay. So my plan was to try and go to page 202 today. Okay. So Daif, unable to bear arms. Okay. Let's continue with this. Dalal in rhetoric, semantics of individual words and sentences. Don't forget, rhetoric, which is the science of persuasion, is in Islam a science. Right. Rhetoric is a science within Islam. And they've got here um so they, they're very very big on categorizing rhetoric as something that they study 
So now they've got semantics of individual words. Don't forget, Islam is able to twist an argument. You've seen how they can twist arguments. Like, for instance, someone made a claim that, well, Islam is very specific circumstances. Very specific circumstances in which you can lie. And I'm like, okay, well, why don't you let me know what those very specific circumstances are, you know, so that we don't make a mistake here. And of course, he won't tell me, he can't tell me. And he, he turns around and says, it's not my job to educate you. That's a very sophist argument. If they were honest, and he's not trying to be honest, at no point are they trying to be honest, because it is compulsory for them to lie to defend Islam. Remember, we've shown this before, again, within the Sharia. It is compulsory, it is obligatory for them to lie. So they've got all these wonderful arguments. Okay, um, And so they study rhetoric. So the scholars have studied rhetoric and this use of rhetoric, persuasion, right? these very clever forms of sophistry have become part and parcel. It's endemic within Islamic culture. Um, Nathaniel says, yeah, Luther was a severe anti-Semite at the end of his life, a bit off-putting. He was also, look, I mean, this is, I'm not a, I'm not a Lutheran. I'm, I'm a self-Protestant. But when I, from my personal view, when I look at the writings of Luther and I look at some of the things he said, Luther was a heretic. Luther went and altered. He made alterations to the Bible. Luther was a megalomaniac. Okay, He was not a nice person. I, I don't see any evidence of... He was a very educated man, a very smart man, but also a very vain man, a very arrogant man. And I think he was a, an extremely misguided man at the end. So, I mean, for instance, I've been looking at the concept of um, sola, sola Scriptura. And I can't see any biblical justification for that okay so i would need a few weeks i'm going to start putting together the arguments and evidence for that but i have some serious issues with that because i'm just trying to look at it from what is the historical perspective what are the historical arguments let's go back to the early church fathers let's go back to the first century and some of these arguments go back to like the very start of the second century from first century where we these guys like the year 106 or earlier right so there's some definite some questions to be raised there. And what is interesting to me is that some of these arguments that are put forward by Protestants who were very, very anti the Catholic Church, very hateful towards the Catholic Church, are very Islamic in nature. Oddly enough, very Islamic. And then there's also, there's also evidence of Gnostic thinking within the Protestant Church. Now, that's not, this is not to say that that, that, that this is bad. That they are bad. Look, man, there's bad dentists, okay? Trust me, I know. There are bad dentists out there. They're bad lawyers. They're bad everything. They're bad priests. They're bad popes. And I absolutely do not trust this current pope. As far as I can throw a piano, I don't think anybody does. Everyone knows there's a problem with this pope. Right? He's definitely a bad pope. But um, but I think there are certain you know, issues that, that, that can be examined within the Protestant church. So... Uh, they just want me to stick with the Bible teaches, not follow church. Okay, so Veronica, there, you said why we should not follow the church leaders and traditions. Then you got to throw out St. Peter, St. Paul, St. John, Mark, Matthew, Luke. Toss them all out the window because don't forget, the Bible was only formed in what? The 4th century, late 4th century, right? So what were they doing for the first three, 400 years prior to that, right? you got to ask yourself because the Bible was only assembled at that point. So what was happening prior to that? And... Where in the Bible does it state that you can only follow the Bible? Nowhere. Right? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can only follow the Bible. Because you have to follow tradition. The Bible does state, if you have a dispute, you need to go to the church. It doesn't say to the Baptist church. It doesn't say to the Lutheran church. It doesn't say to the many, 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 many thousands of branches and divisions and, you know, of the... Um, Protestant churches just go to the church, the one church. So there are questions around that that need to be clarified, things that need to be laid out very neatly, very carefully. So, yeah, the other reforms were afraid of Luther. So, okay, so if it is to say that Calvin is wrong, well, if, look, Paul Anker, look, Islam is the biggest load of bad ideas ever invented. Why are they still Muslims? Um, see, Veronica, that the Catholic Church was not an example of Christian kindness towards anyone who questioned their teachings. Uh, you might be referring to a very, very poorly, historically dishonest um, polemic called the Trail of Blood. A lot of the animosity towards the Catholic Church is based on actual fraudulent, dishonest, pretty filthy writing by, um, by uh, good Christian Protestants who lied out of their butts 
about the Catholic Church who made up history just completely. Liars. Utter liars. Understand? But this, now the source of these lies has been forgotten, right? The source has been forgotten, but the idea, Catholic Church bad, has remained without a reference to the source. But once you start looking for what was the source, where do these ideas come from, and you start looking at it, there's some uh, the, the Protestant churches. You're not going to like what you find when you start to dig. You're definitely not going to be happy. You might want to start thinking that, hmm, 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 issues with some of these Protestants. <clears throat> Arnold Nathanus says, Lloyd, what is your issue with pianos? Uh, yeah, it's, I will try and use different metaphors, uh, you know. Okay, so uh, Michael van der Vlees says, I still regard myself as a Calvinist on a cultural level. You can't escape from Calvinism in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, no, I understood. Look, I come from a Protestant background. I've been a Protestant my whole life. But um, even I can look and see and look. Things don't work here. Because, I mean, there's, yeah, anyway, so those are things I can, I'll look at in the future. Um, all churches, good and bad elements, they're people, but the thing is that there is certain, there's been, there's been corruption in the churches, but that doesn't mean their doctrine is necessarily bad, right? But there's certainly, there have been some issues. Okay, moving on. And I was going to go to page 202 today, so I need to find, okay, here we go. Next thing. Okay, so the Dar al Ad, the land of the covenant, considered by some Muslim jurists as a temporary and intermediate territory between the Dar al Islam and the Dar al Harb. The Dar al Islam is the house of Islam, or the territories, the lands of Islam, and the Dar al Harb, the house of war. In other words, you have the Dar al Islam and you have the house of war, which is everything else which is not under the control of Islam. Right? So this is our. Muslims divide the world, the territory that they control. And whenever they put down a mosque, don't forget, whenever they put down a mosque, this is, they have captured territory. They now control that territory. It's like an embassy of Islam that has gone up in foreign territory. They control that area and they need to expand up from that base of operations. Okay, so they've basically placed one of their Islamic embassies. It's called Waqf. Now, Waqf has the term W-A-K-F or W-A-Q-F. You'll usually see it as endowment, a gift, which is just propagandistic speech. It's just euphemisms. It's a gift from Allah to the Muslims. It's something that is given to the Muslims that they must keep. It's like your grandmother gives you something that, you know, an endowment from your grandmother. You know, she's given you something which you need to now preserve for the future. You know, keep hold of it for the future, for the, you know, for the good of Allah, to make Allah happy. Actually, Waqf means appropriation to steal something to take something right so it's basically theft it's land theft okay which reminds you of what the ANC is doing in South Africa appropriation without compensation pretty much okay it's appropriation they're taking land from those they hate so they're claiming land in the name of Islam now let's have a look here the Dar al Har these are the territories under perpetual threat of a missionary war jihad the classical practice of regarding the territories immediately adjoining the lands of Islam as the Dar al Harb and inviting their princes to adopt Islam under the pain of invasion and is reputed to date back to the Prophet. We know for a fact it goes back to the Prophet. So in other words, the Dar al Harb is any land outside of the borders of Islamic land. They are under the perpetual threat of a missionary or holy war. The classical practice of regarding these territories adjoining lands of Islam and inviting them to adopt Islam under the pain of invasion. I don't think it can get any clearer than that. Okay. Those countries where the Muslim law is not in force. So they need to invade. Okay. The Dar al Hub includes those countries where the Muslim law, the Islamic law, now it doesn't say the Quran is not in force. The Quran's a book you read, you read, what's the law? And again, we come back to the Muslim law. What is the Muslim law? Where is the Muslim law? Okay, so on that point, let me go back and see, read what you guys have written. Um, don't confuse people for ideology, that's what Mohammedism is always doing. But you see, Kogito, their ideology is their identity. There's no separation. Calvinism is a strong influence in some South African churches. No, of course, certainly it is. Um, Muhammad had predestination before Calvin should make you go, hmm, yeah, exactly. Well, Jew hatred was there before uh, Luther got his hands on that idea. And he really ran with it. So, yeah, where did he get that? 
um, to all of us in this discussion, we read 1 Corinthians, right? Um, we'll have to have a label to identify our worldview. Calvin is just a label. Sure, but I mean, ideas have form and structure. They have, like, ideas have specifics within them, right? So, for instance, Calvin rewrote the Bible. He made an edit to the Bible, right? By any definition, that would be to add. Remember, we're not to add words to the scripture or take away from the scripture. Remember, he said, by faith alone, he added that word, alone. He wrote that in, okay? And that changes the doctrine, right? He added that in. And so there, there are issues around it. There's lots to be said just about that one small change. We added that one word, just that one particular issue. There's a lot to be said about, about Luther on that issue. And that alters and misrepresents a lot of doctrine that goes back to the beginning. So let me see. Um, it's not just where they build mosques. You can see them praying on streets, parks. They're laying claim. as a, Exactly, uh, Mariana, they're true. They're laying claim. And yes, they do. I mean, it's, it's, it's a political act. Okay, mosque and state, the one in Islam. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, so let me continue. I was going to go for a couple of pages now. The Dar al-Islam, the land of Islam, the whole territory in which the law of Islam prevails. Now, of course, they don't have any state where the law of Islam fully prevails. Thank you, Zaha. Very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Now, you've got two states where this kind of does prevail. One, ISIS had it. And two, currently today, we have what's known as Afghanistan under the Taliban. Right? This is where the law of Islam prevails what they're doing is fully complied with Islamic law. Now, the thing is, do you suppose, are you supposed to go through the Quran and do exegesis on the fly to figure out, read through 300,000 hadith and figure out what you're supposed to do? Or has someone sifted through all of that, written it down? Remember, we've just learned that the Islamic law was written in books. So have they categorized it and put it in books? And the answer is yes. Okay, remember, and it says here, finally, everything outside of the Dar al-Islam is the Dar al-Hab. Everything outside of the land of Islam is the land of war. That's where you live. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, well, faith alone is not scriptural, and that is true. So, therefore, Luther was wrong, right? And there's a lot more to it than that as well. So... Okay, so moving on, um, let me go, let's go to the beginning. Okay, so for those who are new and not familiar with the, uh, the Reliance of the Traveler, let's have a look at the introduction, just so that, because I'll, I'll, I'll wind up in a few minutes, guys. This is the index, okay? This is the, for instance, the prayer. Now, how many pages of prayer do we have? If we go to section F. There's like nearly 120 pages of knowledge on prayer from 101 to 220. That's a lot of pages. The funeral prayer takes up 24 pages. Zakat takes up 33 pages. Fasting takes up 20 pages. The pilgrimage, okay, that would be this section here. As you can see, would take up, oh, that's a lot of pages. That's like 74 pages of information. So marriage page 506, divorce, 554. So there's 48 pages on marriage, and there's, okay, there's a handful of pages on divorce, like 24 pages on divorce. So, yeah. So understand there's a lot of law, and this is a very small book. This is not even the biggest book of law. Okay, so let's go to one section. Let's just pick a random. Let's go to marriage. Okay, so this, let's look at marriage, book M, marriage. Let's see, because the law is written in topics, okay, like any legal text, let's have a look. Who should marry? Who should not marry? When a man should, when a woman should marry? Desirable characteristics. I'll keep scrolling through this. It's three pages worth of this. Just the index of this chapter is three pages long. It's unlawful to look at other than your spouse and relatives. Looking at your spouse's genitals is offensive. Don't look at your spouse's genitals. Bad, bad you. Okay. A woman may not show herself to non-Muslim women. Fascinating. Okay. Touching is as unlawful as looking. Shaking hands with the opposite sex. The rulings on that. 
Um, for instance, Veronica, you notice I believe that um, Luther wanted to get rid of the book of James. Okay, and there's reasons for that. He wanted to dump certain books out of the Bible, and uh, yeah, so there's some some oddities that go on, and that's that's worth actually looking at from a historical perspective. Um, let's see. Okay, permissible looking. How it's permissible? Rules for proposing the marriage. Telling how a prospective groom's really telling how a prospective prospective groom really is. Okay, blah blah blah. Stipulating conditions such as monogamy. Hmm. Can you? Who knows? We'd have to read it to find out. When a bride has no Muslim guardian, which of the bride's relatives is her guardian? Understand, you can just go on and on and on. Marriage of a foolhardy person requires a guardian. Conjugal rights. Wife's marital obligations. Let's kind of look at that. Wife's marital obligations. M5.1. That's going to be fascinating. Oh, notice here. She must let her husband have sex. She cannot say no. Okay, the husband's rights. So that's going to be fun. Let's have a look at M five point one. We'll go there in a minute. But notice these laws. Look, look at how many there are in just this section. Historical Christianity. Welcome. Good to see you. <clears throat> yeah. So two wives in the same lodgings, permitting the wife to leave the house. No, you can't. She may go anywhere in town. Okay, traveling by herself is unlawful. Husband may forbid her to leave the home. Okay. Taking turns with your wives. Sweet. Equal time for each wife. Awesome. Minimal turn is one night and a day. Husband must draw lots to take one wife on a trip. A wife may give her turn to another wife. Not permissible to visit the wife in another's turn. And the law that will then discuss this. So let's go have a look at M5.1. Let's go find that. Oh, and it says that when you want to marry, you've got to marry if you feel horny. Basically... A man who needs to marry because of horniness and has enough money is recommended to do so because of desire for sexual intercourse because the guy's horny and he has enough money is recommended to do so not when you love someone and you feel that she's gonna make your life complete no 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 that's for idiots like you a man who needs to marry because his balls are turning blue excuse my French and he has enough cash go for it buddy okay so one who needs to marry, why? Because he's about to explode, but does not have enough to pay for these expenses is recommended not to marry, but rather to suppress his desire by fasting. And if it is not suppressed by fasting, then marry, borrowing the money to pay the bride's marriage payment if she will not accept his owing it to her. Um, yeah, well, don't forget, don't forget Veronica. Um, sure, she says, okay, this is true, but as far as I know, Luther changed his opinion in the book of James later. I think it is wise to consider that no one is perfect in their understanding of Scripture, but Luther had a different opinion. Luther believed that no one had a greater understanding of Scripture than he did because he said he didn't need the Pope, he didn't need the Church, because Luther, he was number one with the Scripture, and therefore he was going to do all of that. So he was extremely prideful. Luther was very prideful. As far as I, from what I've discovered, Luther is, was very, very prideful man. So he was going to replace the Pope with himself. He was going to replace church tradition with his own thinking. He was going to replace all the knowledge from the, from the early church fathers with what was going on in his head. So yeah, there's some serious issues around Luther. I mean, seriously, there's some serious issues around that dude. Um, I mean, the more I dig, the worse it gets. You must see some of the things he said. I mean, it's crazy. Okay. So, okay, let's go. We were going to M5.1 and then I'll call it a night, guys. Um, and 3 points. Okay, what's interesting here? Let's have a look. I just skipped past something. Oh, puberty. <clears throat> a virgin's silence is considered as permission to get married. Okay. So if you're if you don't say anything, then that's permission. As for the non-virgin of sound mind, no one may marry to another after she has reached puberty. But of course, before puberty, hmm, I mean, you know, we've got to read this and find out what that really says or means. Okay, M five point one. The wife's marital obligations. It is obligatory for a woman to let her husband have sex with her immediately when he asks her. So that's not a request, that's an instruction, that's a command. At home, meaning the place in which he's currently staying, even if being lent to him or rented, and she can physically endure it. 
Okay, so there you go. So, I mean, fascinating stuff, interesting stuff. Okay, guys, so I will call it a night here. Uh, I've probably... Um, okay, so I'm going to paste here my... Um, again, the show notes that I have, and I'm going to paste the link to this copy of the Encyclopedia of Islam. Everything else is linked in the description. Paul Anker, what is your interpretation of 2433 in relation to prostitution? Can the Muslim male prostitute his sex slave if he wants to? Is it short or short of cash? I think you can. But I, you know, that's a good question. Um, the thing is, look, Islam has a method of, Islam has a method of deception or of, it's called hiyal. It allows them to, to subvert. It allows them to violate any and every law of the Sharia within the Quran, within the Sunnah. It allows them to violate everything legally. Okay, so therefore any rule that is in place can be violated. You've just seen the Sufis can violate every law. They have this antinomian right. But for the rest of them, you've got this you've got this hiyal which allows you to circumvent this. Um, so Veronica says he certainly was prideful as far as I know. His, his anti-Semitism was to largely founded in taking it personal that the Jews rejected his version of Christian thought. Now, look, I mean, seriously, the more I look into, um, I mean, with, at the risk of upsetting people, but I'm just trying to look at this historically, right? Um, the more I read into what this guy did, the, the more I'm like, Luther was not a good man, not a nice man at all. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, guys, so I will call it a night here. Hopefully you've learned something useful about Islam. Um, yeah, hopefully this has been helpful to you. So please download a copy of the Reliance. Okay. There's also the Hedaya, but hopefully you've gained something. Um, yeah, Kogito, that's a very good question that you've asked there at the end. So hopefully guys, um, please download the links. Okay. The silent is the silence of the Virgin. The reason why Muhammad married Aisha at six. Maybe, maybe that, that, that could be where the Sunnah comes from, right? The example could come from that. To be fair, John Chrysostom also said someone say everything about the Jews. Loads of them did. That is also true. Um, but then again, also the church has apologized, the Catholic Church has apologized for some of those statements. Well, the church has apologized for those statements. Um, so yeah, guys, thank you. Um, Jesus forever. Thank you for those live streams that put Islamic indoctrination in perspective. You're very welcome. Hopefully this has been helpful. Um, so yeah, we'll continue from the next word wherever we ended off. Uh, next time so yes guys thank you very much um and we shall see you next time right so have a good night everyone and i've got to figure out where to stop streaming ever thank you thank you um yeah guys so yeah i will see you again in the week i'll probably do something in this week probably tuesday or so okay take care guys good night